When the game first came out, I, like most of you, wanted quick advice to muscle past some of the game's difficulty checks, and I didn't get much. Surely people have more advice to give than power walking through the game with double zimmies and songbirds, or stabbing everything with a motorized fire poker. But all I saw were people sharing their builds online and saying how they used it to put a balding science professor out of his misery in less than 20 seconds. I don't, I don't know why I have this headcanon of, of Snail being a thinning man in his mid-60s who teaches robotics at the University of St. Gives a Shit, but I can't get rid of it. Know what else I can't get rid of? My uninhibited excitement for Dun <laughs> Dungeon Hunter 6. Whatever, I had writer's block today, let's just do it. Dungeon Hunter is one of the longest-running mobile ARPG franchises in the internet's history, and it's continuing that legacy with Dungeon Hunter 6. Not only does it throw over a hundred uniquely designed bosses at you to fight, each with different strengths, weaknesses, weaknesses and strategies you need to implement, you can also fly them, ride them, summon them to participate in other much harder battles as you progress, and even turn into them in the late game. If you told me some of the bosses could organize your tax information, I would probably believe you for like two seconds. Dungeon Hunter has always been about making the combat feel as smooth as possible, and the sixth installment takes advantage of today's graphical capabilities with these visually beautiful animations that lend themselves to chaining together different skills. You can either play solo and enjoy the PvE experience, or you can participate in guild wars and raids with or against your friends in a surprisingly very well fleshed out PvP mode. Customize your mount and show it off to all your friends. Sell all your belongings in an auction. And what's a hack and slash dungeon crawler without skill tree? Use my link in the description and pinned comment, or scan this QR code to download the game for free and get a starter pack valued at around $50. Additionally, there's a launch event the devs are hosting starting on October 15th, where you can win a bunch of cool prizes like a PS5 or an iPhone 15 Pro Max. More info in the description. AH-12HC Helicopter Drag it to the other side of the arena and use the buildings as cover against its missile barrages. If it's about to get staggered, close distance and make sure your pulse blade is off cooldown, and you'll have barely enough time to cram in two full uses of the pulse blade before it starts attacking again. Tester AC Watch for when he lunges at you with a pulse blade attack and move backwards until his reach expires before moving in with your own pulse blade. He also stands completely still in this part of the arena and won't aggro until you either fire at him first or get within relatively close range of him. I don't know what his official aggro range is, but I was able to tease around the 180 meter mark and still not catch his attention, so. Bring the fight near the wall of the facility you're supposed to be destroying, and his cronies will barely be able to get to you. He has a lot more health than he probably ever should, so take advantage of the Pulse Blade's huge damage by basically just spamming it whenever it's off cooldown. Iguazu and Volta usually take care of the rest. Strider. Approach the Strider from behind by veering hard to the left and you can avoid the eye laser's attacks altogether. Buy yourself a chunky single-shot missile launcher to take most of the hassle out of taking down the generators. And once you've destroyed the generator on the top, restart from your last checkpoint and it'll spawn you right in front of the Strider's eye. Juggernaut. Anticipate when the Juggernaut wants to turn around by quick boosting over its head and then immediately quick boosting again in the opposite direction. If done correctly, it'll literally just turn around and let you continue slapping its ass cheeks. If you're feeling dexterous, you can catch it while it's being still, position yourself directly on top of this conveniently sized rectangle of space right behind its shield, and hang on for your dear insignificant life as it tries to shake you off like it's getting stung by a wasp. Little Zahi. Little Zui relies on heavy firepower units like grenade launchers and bazookas. These units have extremely long cooldowns, leaving her very vulnerable after missing a shot, so just hang back and wait until she fires. Be mindful of the path you're taking to get to the fight, as you can easily route yourself to where the fifth combat log you obtain is right where Little Zui descends down to fight you. Sorry. Sulla's agility makes him seem intimidating, but he's actually very easy to outmaneuver using the arena's verticality. If he ever dips below the main platform and into the ocean, use this as an opportunity to attack him from above, and he'll almost never be able to counter it. During the second phase, he'll switch between missile salvos and flamethrower sweeps. You can use verticality by ascending to avoid his flamethrower and then simply falling back down to avoid the missile salvos. Once the bullet spam has died down, you can rapidly close in and hover underneath him to avoid his shotguns. No, Zach. You're fighting in a very enclosed space, so melee weapons are great here to conserve your ammunition. Wait until he boosts himself into a corner and just punch him with something. You'll probably kill him in like two swings. DCH04 Smart Cleaner. 
As the fight begins, charge straight at it and then time a quick boost backwards as the cleaner's arms are at the highest point in the air. The initial slam attack will literally miss you by a couple inches, allowing easy damage into its core region once the arms have repositioned. If the cleaner decides to ram you with its hull and not its arms, don't even move out of the way. Just face tank the hit and continue applying pressure. Anything that isn't the arms or the lava it shoots will inflict extremely negligible damage. Deal with the drones before the fight by hovering around the crates and letting them fly into surfaces. You'll get credit for destroying them without using ammo, which contributes to an S ranking for the mission. It's easy to stagger with explosive damage, but it takes so much time getting off its ass that once this happens, you spend valuable time reloading all your weapons while it's in the middle of recovery. Either keep a dependable quick cooldown melee weapon on you like the laser dagger, or just boost kick the shit out of it to kill time waiting for everything to reload. Heavy warship. Once you hear the dialogue signaling the PCA warship, don't waste any ammunition on what's about to get deep fried here in the next two seconds. Just destroy the two helicopters here and then don't fire at anything else until you see the PCA fleet flying into view. This conserves ammo and contributes to an S rank at the end of the mission. PCA at drone boy. The Ectromoy are highly mobile ACs that like buzzing around in between landing attacks, so go for a rapid-fire pressure build with high firearm specialization. Machine guns and multi-cell missile launchers tend to work well. This is because slower units with harder-hitting bullets tend to have a much higher ammunition cost. Sure, it may kill them quicker, but it doesn't always pay to use shotguns and laser rifles for every boss. V7 Swinburne. Approach him from behind, but at a slight distance, and use shoulder units with high impact damage like the stun needle or the ear shot. With enough impact, you can force him into ACS strain immediately as the fight begins. Get him trapped in a stun baton combo and repeat the same tactic. When he talks to you, stop firing, get him to think you're ceasing fire and wait for the HUD to adjust accordingly, and from there, one bullet from pretty much anything is all it'll take. It's cheap, and you're probably a dick and a coward, but it's that much less of a burden on your ammo costs. AH-12HC Helicopter Second Battle when Air mentions the Xylem defense system you can hijack during this fight, don't listen to her. The suppressive fire is so negligible that it barely ever matters and you can efficiently bottleneck your final score by a whole letter grade by doing so. By this point in the game, you should have plenty of high impact, high damage units you've been playing around with, so don't feel the need to commit to assault boosting towards anything and just play the pressure game instead. Bring Freddy. Ring Freddy starts charging at you right after you pick up the combat log in the mission, eliminate the enforcement squads. Pin him against the rock face behind you to massively limit his movement and use a strong coral or pulse burst weapon to cancel his shield when he brings it out. PCA Heavy Cavalry. Focus on not taking any damage from the LCs at the very beginning of the mission while conserving as much ammo as possible, saving yourself some wiggle room during the HC fight. You can heal a couple times and still get away with an S rank if you take him down quickly enough. AASO2 Cataphract. The Cataphract has a glaringly fragile weak point located at its center. It only deals contact damage if it's actually charging at you, though. You can recognize its charging telegraph by the track skidding across the ground. This means, as long as it's not charging, you can predict where it'll relocate to and just lodge yourself right in between its tracks, opening an opportunity to pour massive chunks of damage into its weak point with minimal risk of being damaged yourself. Honest Brute if you have a tetrapod, you can use the hover function to sneak behind where Honest Brute is standing and waiting to ambush you, allowing a window for you to take the first strike. It's as my old friend Confucius say, the hunter has become the hunter dead, and the chaser has become the chost. Nightfall Raven. Nightfall Raven is the shining example of why a meta build means precisely dick and balls if you give it to an NPC boss. His pile bunker and songbirds both have very recognizable and easily punishable telegraphs, and his missile salvos are negligible to the point where you can hover in any given direction and they'll just nosedive into the sand. If you really try and take your time, you might even be able to hear the entire dialogue sequence before the fight ends. I do. I swear. The Ice Worm always begins the fight by coming to the surface twice. Stay to the left of it and watch for the second time it surfaces, and then score an easy shot on its head. Once you've taken down its shields one time, inflict just enough damage to force it into the second phase, and then assault boost all the way to the other side of the field. This is where the Ice Worm starts deploying drones, and it'll always relocate over here once it begins its next phase. The reason this is important is because it spends a lot of time being relatively still when doing this, allowing for an easy second takedown. Once you've activated the access point and gained entry to the lower half of the freefall, head to the left and start teasing the edge of the catwalks as you fall to prevent being overwhelmed with missiles. Descend down from them one at a time until you count three, then drop past the fourth catwalk to prevent aggroing any MTs patrolling the catwalks perpendicular to you. I promise it's worth saving the ammo. This oversized urinal cake isn't able to hurt you once you're beneath it, but if you really want to lock in that S rank, you should still try to finish it off as quickly as your cooldowns allow. 
Gun 5, Iguazu. Shave down his ACS with Gatling guns, then plug him with a pair of stun needles once he's staggered for the bonus damage. The stun needle has the second highest direct hit adjustment of any shoulder weapon at 195, which is a large reason why the needle is so popular. So if Iguazu doesn't immediately just explode from you implementing this strategy, the only way he'd still be alive would be if he's either left with a hair of HP or the game just bent you over and fucked you somehow. If you're on the alternative mission where you're ambushed by Cold Call instead, race back into the tunnel as soon as Air starts talking and you can force him into an uncomfortable comfortable close quarters battle where he can't be nearly as evasive. AAPO3, Enforcer. If you ignore all the standard enemies throughout the mission, you can save most of your resources for the fight against the Enforcer. Invest in shoulder units with high direct hit adjustments like the True No Needle Launcher or the Stun Needle, and invest in high impact rapid fire arm units like the Gatling Gun or the Aperitif Missile Launcher, which is the, the one the one that looks like a, a beehive. I'm assuming a lot of people might not know the exact names. Shred down its ACS with your arms, blast his HP with your shoulders. CO1, Ephemera. The Ephemera AC will always begin the fight with a slash from its Moonlight Arm unit. To counter this, rush to its starting position and spring an Assault Armor charge, which should lead to an immediate stagger. It's a highly evasive AC, so you can fire a weapon with a lower ammo cost to proc a dodge, and then preemptively fire a deadlier weapon to ensure that it connects. Guide 1, Michigan. If you're aiming for an S rank, consider using the Flamethrower for the first half of the mission. It's a cost-efficient crowd control unit that can melt through swarms of smaller MTs with very little error margin, and you'll always have enough firepower left over for the actual fight with Michigan. If you want to take extra measures to really lock in the S, go for a tank build with high AP and equip it with pulse armor to ensure maximum survivability without needing to heal. Don't pussyfoot around and wait for two minutes with middle flat well like you're planning a picnic or something. Go hunt for extra dialogue in another playthrough. Jump straight past the meeting point and stand right in front of the door like a supermarket greeter and you'll guarantee a direct impact shot from any weapon of your choosing. Equip yourself for a close quarters encounter and then force them into the room they entered from for a much quicker battle. You are rusty. ACs like Steel Haze are highly mobile and have builds centered around fast maneuvers, so set up a tank build, wait for an opportunity to push him into a corner, and spring an assault armor charge on him. D6 Mater Link and Gun 3 will boil high. Mater Link being preoccupied with a scuffle with rival MTs makes her incredibly easy to sneak up on. Don't get any closer than around 300 meters within range, perch yourself atop a relatively high building, and begin the fight with a burst damage weapon with high impact like a rocket launcher. Then just drag Mater Link back towards the direction you entered to prevent fighting both ACs at the same time. IB-01, Cell 240. During the Cell 240's second phase, its very first laser barrage can be easily avoided altogether by just assault boosting straight at it. It spends most of its time creating all the distance it can between itself and the barrel of your shotgun you totally aren't using. Most of its blade attacks can be easily ignored as long as you do a good enough job hanging out under it, and then counterattacking with burst damage weapons like the stun needle, grenade launcher, bazookas, or laser cannons. Yeah, see, comments? I use more than just double zimmies, I promise. The one, Freud. Fighting Freud out in the open is a very bad idea because his scatter bazooka can stagger you from zero strain in a single use. Use the four buildings here to fight around instead. He's usually too smart to get stuck in between them, so he'll end up flying over them after only a second or two. But if you look for him to do this, you can easily meet him up at the top with some damage of your own. Air. Air's Coral Oscillator can be easily sidestepped by quick boosting towards the opposite direction she's swinging, and you can then take advantage of the brief pawns to counter with the Stun Needle or any weapon that's good against shields. It's also possible to quick boost in the same direction and still end up outranging it, but I wouldn't recommend it because it's not nearly as consistent. B2, Snail. Just skip him. Fighting him means nothing if you're risking an S-Rank. Cinder Carlo and Chatty Stick. Most of the difficulty comes from the screen being colored orange from all the hundreds of missiles being fired at any given moment. Carla is easily the more aggressive of the two, so bait her around one of the pillars tucked away in the corner of the arena. Chatty is already much less likely to put any significant pressure on you due to your positioning, but if you're mindful of where he is in relation to the pillars, you can use them as cover, fully exploiting his blind spots to the point where you can almost completely ignore him and focus on Carla first. Handler Walter. Walter's Coral Oscillator has a great amount of vertical tracking, so simply ascending or descending won't be enough to consistently avoid it. Instead, move in the direction it's traveling and close distance towards Walter. The beam is very slow and will have trouble keeping up with you before it naturally expires, so you can use this as a perfect chance to close in with a charged melee attack like the Stun Baton or Laser Lance. Also, you can boost kick the two engines at the very start of the mission to save ammo cost, and just stay near the center so you don't take damage. I'll introduce this following segment with a spoiler warning 
planning for the remaining two playthroughs. New Game Plus and Plus 2 are incredibly different experiences from the base game, with completely new mission bosses and content, so even if you've beaten the game, make sure you've, like, actually beaten the game prior to continuing. Gun 4 Volta and Gun 5 Iguazu. Go after Iguazu first. Volta's tank build means he'll have a much harder time crossing to the other side of the mountain to get to you. Once they're joined up, use the large facility behind them to bait Iguazu into eating your attacks. He's much better at keeping up with you speed-wise, so he'll always stay in view while Volta will constantly get left behind at a lower altitude. You can always use the additional firepower from the Rubiconians, if they can make it to you. And judging by what passes for artillery on Rubicon, that's an if bigger than the mountain you're fighting beside. Gun 2, Nile. The hardest part of this boss is honestly just making sure the damn chopper stays together. Keep a pair of high-pressure, high-magazine arm units to lessen reload times. Deal with the smaller MTs first by firing at them with only one of your arm units, keeping one free so you aren't completely helpless during a reload. Niall will be focused on you while ordering the MTs to attack the chopper, so there's little need to worry about Niall going after the chopper himself. Gun 5, Iguazu, New Game Plus. During the mission, stop the secret data breach. You'll be intercepted by Iguazu and then ambushed by stealth ACs of an unknown origin that attack both of you. Ignore Iguazu's baseless claims of you both being in danger since you actually know how to fucking dodge and he doesn't. Let the electric flails used by the enemy ACs munch on his ACS bar until he gets staggered and then throw whatever meaningful damage you have at him. You'll probably kill him before he can even heal. Prevent corporate salvage. Sneak up on one of the two LCs and laser the shit out of them for massive initial damage. With high-impact weapons like the Viento or a burst machine gun, you can mulch them quickly enough to have the arena completely clean for the new HC. Once that happens, lure him into swinging at you with his laser blade. He'll have a moment of pause that allows him to receive follow-up damage. Team, Chartreuse, and Raven. Don't go after King first just because he's on higher ground. They're both pretty mobile despite being tankier builds. Go after Chartreuse first because she has a smaller HP pool to fight you with and tease the edge of the dam you're fighting on to ensure you always have a tactical advantage. With a little finesse, you can kill both ACs before Raven even shows up. Before Rusty and Middle Flatwell. Middle Flatwell only shows up with half HP and no repair kits, so burst him down as soon as he flies into the fray and you can just continue the fight like normal. Cataphract and Ekdromoy. Fight the two Ekdromoy units first while navigating around the bridge and using it for cover. They're extremely easy to take down since all three bosses will be targeting Kate first. Once that's taken care of, target the Cataphract and just wedge yourself in front of its glass nutsack and start firing. Thumbdolmayan. Thumdolmayan is a piece of shit. I'd advise not fighting him anywhere except right where he greets you. Using all the buildings for cover seems like a good idea on paper until you realize at some point you're gonna have to return fire, and shooting through buildings is kinda difficult. Either keep him at your level by fighting him on the platform you're standing on, or drag him down under the bridge, wait for him to get near a wall, and pin him with an assault armor charge. O'Keefe has an annoying tendency to use verticality to his advantage, and in such a wide open space to fight in, you may be tempted to follow him, but don't. Force him to fight on your terms. The large rotunda at the center of the pit gives you plenty of space. Chasing him off of it will put you in a very uncomfortable spot since you'll almost never have the boost capacity to keep up with him in the air, and you'll be forced to land on a much more inconvenient platform. Two snail and gun five Iguazu. Both ACs here are more built for the ground game, so use a tetrapod build for sustained airtime and chip away at them with pressure fire. If you're far enough away, they'll usually just target each other. Snail gets silly every now and then and thinks he can come at you with his oversized laser pointer, but that's a really easy attack to punish. Gun 6, red. Ignore him. He's just gonna jeopardize your S rank. D3, light cavalry fader. He's a light cavalry unit with twice as many missiles. Not sure what tips I can give here that most don't already know, but if you manage to ignore most of the regular MTs leading up to the fight, you can likely forego the resupply and avoid doing damage to your final mission rank. If you choose not to ignore them, consider units with a high ammo reserve and low ammo cost like the Gatling guns or the flamethrower. Burst him down quickly in his first phase, play the long game in his second. Go for the two plasma satellites while air keeps everyone distracted. When Iguazu is reduced to half HP in his second phase, there's a brief delay between when his damage resistance expires and when he actually starts fighting again. Make sure all your weapons are off cooldown to take as much advantage of the opening as possible. 